There we are, almost on time, a minute late. I'm sure you can forgive us. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome to NFA Live. It is Thursday once again. It has rolled around. Thank you for joining us here on Coin Bureau Clips. Uh, it's great to be back. I've been away for a week or so. Um, I am, uh, as ever, joined by uh, Ben. Ben, greetings. Good to see you. Hey, thanks for having me. And uh, by Rob, our friendly neighborhood baritone. Um, no. today. Rob is... Rob is coming off the back of a dose of flu, and I must say, sounds amazing. I got to um, tell you, uh, thank you, guy. I got to tell you, if if uh, this is one of the first times that I'm sick, and I think Ben is healthy, so this is maybe this is when we see all time highs. I don't know. <laughs> I think so. I th I just think that's a that's a great voice, Rob. If if uh, if I heard that on a voiceover, I would buy it, whatever it was, straight off, straight off the bat. Yeah. Um, so thank everyone for joining. Um, uh, as usual, if you uh, if you don't already follow Ben and Rob, then there are links below, and I highly recommend that you do. Um, we are going to be talking today uh, about uh, some of the big news in crypto that's come out over the last uh, over the last twenty four hours or so. There's a few bits. A lot of it's sort of quite bad news, but we are going to try and uh, talk about some good things as well. And if you guys have questions for Ben, Rob, or even myself. Um, then please do leave them in the comments and uh, I will try and pick some out as we go along and then we'll kind of get to those after we've discussed uh, the talking points um, for today's stream. So uh, without further ado, let's get the first of those talking points underway, which is, of course, um, I'm sure you guys all saw this, but yesterday uh, our friends over at the SEC uh, went after Uniswap. Um, they sent a Wells notice to Uniswap, uh, which for anyone unfamiliar is basically a letter that says we're going to sue you unless you can come up with a really good reason why we shouldn't. Um, so, yeah, Uniswap is the latest uh, crypto entity that is in the sights of the SEC. So I'm really keen to hear what you guys have to say about this. R Rob, can I start with you? Um, what are your thoughts on on the SEC's sort of latest uh, latest attack on the industry. Well, even the even the uh, founder said he's not uh, he's not really surprised, just annoyed at what's happening. So, like, I mean, we've talked about this many times. The SEC. There's a couple of things to point out. First of all, nobody sues anybody unless they have the financial resources and time frames to go along with it. The great thing about the SEC is they are unlimited in what their capacity is able to do because it is funded by the US taxpayer, that's us. So essentially they're here to protect us by going against our interest and using our money that we pay in taxes, which are due by April 15th, I will have already remind everybody, that they're gonna use that money to go against all of the different centralized exchanges, the decentralized exchange and everything else. So that is a problem, but that's something that we should know. And there's a, there's a couple of things, and I, I talked about this I mean, and we talked about this a long time ago, which was I said, bullies won't ever back down. The only way that you you deal with a bully is you have to punch them in the face. And if you just bow down to them and be uh, essentially scared, then they'll keep coming after you again and again. Just take a look at Kraken. They were sued. They complied. They said, we're OK. And then the SEC came back again and said, hey, we're going to sue you for this as well. So. If we want to keep going down this route, that's fine. And the, and the, the the last thing I'll say about it is that people will say, well, you know, the SEC keeps taking losses and Gary's just a loser and da da da. Gary's having the last laugh because he gets to use the un you know the the unamountable uh, resources that he has to go against all the different exchanges, and um, you know that'll push out. The, well, the last point I'll say is. That'll push out the different exchanges. That'll push out the uh, crypto projects. Because if you're a crypto project or if you're a platform, why would you ever incorporate here in the United States? What you would want to do is you want to go overseas. And I thought about what would actually happen if in the 90s, the US government was this staunch against the, the dot-com companies? Would we have the Googles? Would we have the Amazons? Would we have these companies here? No, we wouldn't. They'd go over someplace else. And of course, the taxes that they would generate for these different countries that they went to would be a windfall and it would be very good for them. So if it's if it's me and the other countries, if it's the EU, if it's Dubai, if it's Portugal, if it's El Salvador, I would be applauding this decision, being very happy. 
because I'd say this is fantastic because now I can get these companies to come over here. And uh, in the long run, it won't really matter because crypto is global. And it saddens me because uh, this isn't the country that I remember growing up in. But uh, here we are. But again, if you, it, as an investor, you have to understand that, it, again, in the long run, it's not going to be a big deal because they'll just go someplace else. It's a vacuum. And then uh, we'll pick up the slack and the U.S. will be left behind yet again because of the people that are in power. They're not here for you. They're here to protect the special interests. And that's just the way it is. Well said, Rob. Well said. Um, Ben, can I can I turn to you? And and I just want to I, I want to ask mainly. I don't I don't think it's probably a, a huge surprise to any people that the SEC is going after another crypto entity. Um, is it perhaps a surprise that they're going after Uniswap? Um, you know, a decentralized exchange, uh, a protocol that has been around for about six years. You know, which is old in you know crypto terms, um, and is certainly not i think what you might uh have classified as one of the bad guys so yeah is it was it, are you surprised that they've gone after uniswap in particular not really i mean if you think about it it seems like a lot of the people they've gone after have been the good guys and the people they didn't go after ended up being the things that sort of blew up and everyone lost their money you know um so it's kind of funny about how they've their their attempts to protect investors have more so sort of isolated investors from useful platforms that have been around for a long time and then some of the newer platforms that they really should be investigating or they should have investigated you know before they went down like you know FTX is one um those just sort of slip through so I, I'm not really that surprised and you know Rob I I, I saw Rob's tweet about it and he, he basically said what he's always said, and he's absolutely right. I mean, he said, he said, you know, like, if we don't stand together, they'll pick us, they'll pick everyone off one by one. And I think he said that what you probably, Rob, didn't you say like two years ago too? Um, yes. And ever, and ever since then, it's like one by one, you know, they go after one exchange that they went after Kraken not that long ago. I think they're still going after them. I mean, I, we've seen various things with Coinbase, right. um, you know, it, it's just, this is the way it's, it, it's going to be. I mean, and, and even at one point they went after um, the whole Ripple stuff, right? XRP and and all that stuff. So I'm not really that surprised. I, I, I think this is. And by the way, I mean, longevity doesn't necessarily mean anything for them because they move so slowly. You know, I think about everything yeah. we've witnessed and like how long things take to, to play out in these in these cycles. It, it takes years for for some of these sort of regulatory actions to come into play. So I'm not really that surprised that it took them this long. Um, I would say I'm not surprised. I'm, I'm just disappointed, right? I mean, it's probably kind of like, you know, you, you're, if your kid disappoints you, you know, and you know, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. It's, <laughs> I, I, I sort of feel like that, like it's, you know, I, I guess I feel like that for the most part. So my, my guess is they'll just continue to do that sort of stuff. And, you know, I mean, there's just a reminder that a lot of these things that you look at, a lot of these, um you know different platforms they there there is an inherent risk not in and of themselves but just because of like regular like regulation regulatory stuff that can come come down at any time and then that's just something you know to sort of remind ourselves on a uh, remind ourselves of on an ongoing basis yeah yeah very true. I don't have, I must say, I don't have an awful lot to add to what you guys have said, but I mean, from, because we were sort of looking into how these SEC actions work. We did a video because you might remember, well, it's, it's actually fair, it just a couple of weeks ago, I think, um, it was revealed that the SEC is also investigating uh, Ethereum, well, or investigating entities in Ethereum's ecosystem. So things like the Ethereum Foundation and what have you. And we did a video on that where we sort of, dug into what the process is. So um, for those who didn't catch that, so Uniswap would have known that this Wells notice was coming because um, there's a kind, there's a process called pre-Wells, um, mm. which is when they sort of let them know that, the, you know, a letter is on its way. And so now um, I think it's Wells submission f uh, phase. So Uniswap has uh, 30 days, you know, a month essentially um, to respond to this Wells notice and to say, look, you know, here are all the reasons why you shouldn't sue us. 
um, that then gets sent back to the SEC. Um, the SEC then takes some time to go through that. But I should say, uh, you know, in 80 percent of cases, I think, uh, where a Wells notice is sent out, um, it, an action generally follows. So it's not completely it's not completely hopeless, uh, you know, for, for, for it's not a, um, a complete waste of time for Uniswap to uh, mm. submit a response. But it most likely will um, result in a lawsuit. And I guess the interesting thing, and perhaps maybe the really troubling thing, will be to see what the actual contents of that lawsuit contain. You know, what what the actual um, what the actual charges are. I think that could be that could be very interesting. Um, I just want to draw your attention to. Uh, a great comment um, someone left earlier uh, when we started talking about this from JH. Uh, Uniswap announced profit sharing, um, which was obviously what pumped uh, the Uni token a, a few weeks ago. Um, I think that will be one of the issues the SEC brings up in the lawsuit. Profit sharing creates an expectation of profit, obviously. Um, so perhaps, you know, perhaps these kind of recent actions are recent actions by Uniswap. They they may have some bearing on this on this action, but I, I think Ben, you're right. You know these things these things are a long time in the making. It doesn't matter that Uniswap has been around for however many years. You know the SEC kind of gets round to these things eventually. So I wouldn't be surprised if this was something that's been that's been cooking for a while. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think like I say, I think it'll be it'll be very interesting and possibly a little bit scary to see. Um, to see what exactly is 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 contained within that lawsuit, um, I think uh, yeah, and I, I should also mention as well. This is something this is something that we dug up in in that video about the SEC investigating Ethereum. Um, kind of everyone assumes that this is Gary Gensler. You know, this is this is him um, wielding his sword of truth and justice and going after uh, after the crypto industry. It's actually, from what we found, it's actually a bit more troubling than that because. You know, Gary's just head of the agency. Obviously, he's he's revealed himself to be very anti-crypto, but he is not the person who is responsible for bringing these actions. Um, the person responsible is actually uh, their, um, uh, the SEC's sort of legal guy, the, the SEC's enforcement uh, officer, which is a chap um, called Gerber Graywell, who is um, no relation to Coinbase's chief legal officer, Paul Graywell. But, um, you know, and, and what we found was obviously we all know that Gary actually does understand how crypto works because obviously there's that, you know, there's that footage of him talking at MIT and, you know, a lot of people, myself included, with sort of had quite high, quite high hopes for him originally because he did understand blockchain and he did understand how this thing worked. Um, Gerbier, from what from what we've seen, really doesn't. He doesn't understand crypto. He doesn't like it, um, and that I think makes him perhaps a lot more a lot more dangerous, a lot more troubling. So, um, you know that that could be one of the reasons why we're getting you know actions against the likes of uh, against the likes of Uniswap. But um, yeah, it just seems crazy when there are so many genuinely bad actors out there. And, uh, and the SEC chooses to go after Uniswap. Sounds like a, uh, well said, sounds like a super team. You know, you've got Gary Gensler who doesn't like, who doesn't like crypto and he's the head of the SEC and you've got his head counsel who's like, I really don't understand it, but I really don't like it. Okay, go after these guys, go for those guys. That works out perfectly. Yeah. So, yeah, see how it well, works you know, out. I think when he was appointed the chair of the SEC, I mean, like, I think we were all celebrating it because we yeah. thought, you know, he would be a good because I mean, because of what we had seen before, and then obviously things change. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Again, very disappointing. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's so that's Uniswap, and as I say, that's going to sort of bubble along for a bit. I, I must say, the market seemed to shake it off. Obviously, Uni, the token itself, is is damn pretty bad, but the overall market, the overall crypto market doesn't seem to have, uh, seems to have taken it very much in its stride. And that kind of leads me on to the next talking point that I wanted uh, to discuss with you guys, which also sort of affected the markets, but now they seem to have shrugged it off. And that's uh, the CPI uh, from yesterday, 
which came in a bit hotter than expected. <clears throat> Excuse me, markets didn't really like it. Um, but as I say, they do seem to have shrugged, shrugged it off. The chances of no pivot in June, though, is now 80%. That's according to the FedWatch tool, if that's, you know, if that's a tool that you, um, uh, that you use. So, so, guys, what are your thoughts on this? Ben, can I start with you? Because you're, you're, sort of, you're our macro correspondent, if you like. Um, let me try to share my screen here. See if I can. All right, can you see that? Yeah. Um, gotcha. Yeah. So I mean, look, inflation came in, and I, I think a lot of people have sort of taken the news, and they've they've definitely the the narrative has, has shifted. But you know, going from three percent to two percent is always sort of the hardest. The last mile is the hardest mile. Um, and at the end of the day, we haven't really seen it reaccelerate. I, I think that's sort of the narrative that is is sort of going around the the circle right now that inflation is reaccelerating. But I, I look at this and I just say, you know, it's really just been between three percent and about four percent, you know, really since since June of 2023. So I don't really view this as a reacceleration. I know a lot of people are are looking at the 70s and comparing it to that and saying that we're going to get a second wave. And we could get a second wave. Uh, I mean, you can see back in 72, we essentially bottomed out at around 3% right here with inflation in July of 72, um, which I believe was because um, this would have been the midterm year. Yeah, so that would have been the election year, right? So I think we're, we're going we're going to find out soon enough <laughs> if the Fed means business or uh, if they're going to sort of fall for the same mistakes that their their predecessors fell for and that be, would be to pivot too soon. Um, you know, if they were to pivot too soon and and go back to much looser monetary policy and more importantly, turn the money printer on, uh, which we've all you know grown to love, mm -hmm. that could very well lead to a another wave of inflation. I don't think we are I don't think that that has to be the path. Right. I, I don't think that has to be the path. I'm, I'm hoping that they've learned from their mistakes. But, you know, they do say that human behavior does tend to repeat itself. Um, so I'd be looking at that. And then I would say, you know, there's another counterpoint. If you go back to the 1940s, coming out of a period of high inflation, they didn't, you know, they, they didn't pivot soon enough. And then we actually saw the market go deflationary. Right. We actually went deflationary. Mm -hmm. And that's why sort of threading the needle uh, to a soft landing is so difficult because you have to, like the Fed has to stay tight enough for long enough to make sure that you don't see the 1970s repeat. But if you stay too tight for too long, then you could end up seeing, you know, things go deflationary, which sounds kind of good when you think about it. I mean, like it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world for, you know, groceries and all these expenses to go back down. The problem is if if those things are going down, then it probably means asset prices are going down too. Um, so I, I think that's kind of where we are right now. And looking at at sort of this watch tool over here, mm -hmm. the first rate cut is the, the now the most likely time for a rate cut isn't coming really until uh, July. July. I mean, you might you might look at this and say, well, isn't it September? But no, technically, it's still July at this point. Because you know the the odds of of staying at at five and a half percent are less than fifty percent in July, um, and the odds of a rate cut or at least you know twenty five basis points or fifty basis points is still greater than fifty percent. So we'll see if it if it comes then. My my interpretation of all this stuff though has and I've said this a few times before. And it's kind of confusing, is that the pricing out of rate cuts will cause them to get priced back in. That's kind of my view and. We're starting to see that happen because we were looking at one point we were having what six rate cuts this year according mm -hmm. to the market and now it's dropped to only two rate cuts this year mm -hmm. so we've seen these rate cuts get priced out right four of them have now been priced out of the year now the problem with that is that for companies like nvidia for apple mm -hmm. google you know who cares right they're gonna survive they're fine for smaller companies, for like, you know, restaurants, um, like small mom and pop restaurants and for those sorts of things. And, and even for some of the other larger companies like like Tesla and, and some of the, the EV companies that are trying to become, you know, successful, like Rivian and Lucid and all these other companies. Right. They're really struggling. 
because they would really like looser monetary policy right now so that they could get, you know, so that interest rates would go down and so that, you know, people would be more incentivized to get one of these cars or whatever it might be. But I think that's really causing some issues. And so what's happening is while a lot of companies are doing quite well, you know, if you look at bankruptcies, I mean, they are going up, right? This is really low, all things considered, but they are starting to go back up. And so you might you might get to the point where some companies they just they they get so that they struggle so much with these rate cuts that were promised by many like a year ago, two years ago. They keep getting pushed further and further out. So then they go bankrupt because they just they can't they can't wait any longer. Think about how many, um, uh, you know, I mean, there, there were a lot of I've, I've heard a lot of stories about how like people bought houses and they were encouraged to buy a house because they could just refinance, you know, six months later. And now here we are, you know, we're now in, in so approaching mid 2024 and, you know, rate cuts, even if they were to cut rates, it's, it wouldn't, according to the market, it wouldn't really be that much, not really enough to move the needle. Um, so I think that is kind of what's happening. So my, my, my view on this is that, you know, you can't put a lot of faith into these probabilities because all it takes is one bad data point to completely change everything. Um, so what I would say is, is, yeah, I think, I think the pricing out of these rate cuts is what eventually causes a, a lot of them to get priced back in. And my, my, my worry there is that when they do get priced in, it could be sort of more of a panic pricing back in than, you know, sort of like a more methodical, Hey, let's just slowly cut and get ahead of whatever's coming. And I, I think the, the, the way it relates to crypto, because everyone usually cares about that is. When you look at, you know, you said that the, the, the market is holding up on well, Bitcoin is, I mean, it, it really is doing really, really well. Um, altcoins are starting to, you know, they're starting to roll over here against Bitcoin again. And, and so, you know, back over here when they rolled over and they finally broke support, that was actually a month before the Fed pivoted. Right. Um, I, I kind of think that alts represent the, the average consumer. Mm. Um, you know, that's where... <laughs> The, uh, the degen, you know, as all of us degens like to hang out. But I, I think that if if that breaks and we start to go down here, mm -hmm. it might represent the consumer starting to falter a little bit. And then that then you could see all those rate cuts get priced back in. If we stay above that level and we just sort of come back down and, and go back up or something, then, yeah, I mean, we, the market does what it does best. And we just keep kicking the can down the road until we have to uh, until we have to face the music. But one of the things we've talked about forever, and this goes back to you know, to the whole Uniswap stuff is that like a lot of that stuff can just keep getting whittled away until eventually the Fed pivots and then all those higher risk stuff start to to do a bit better. Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, Rob, are you because one of the things I was one of the things I was thinking about when, you know, when sort of digesting these CPI figures and stuff is that I see so much on on Twitter and and elsewhere about people talking about you know the cost of living seems to be a really big topic everywhere. So many people are talking about it, and I'm seeing stats that are saying you know certain things. I, I think one of the one of the ones that sticks in my mind is like you know beef, for instance, is up seven percent. So I mean, when we get things like the the, the CPI saying oh you know in, inflation sort of stubbornly stuck around this level is that i mean does that feel real to you because it seems like the actual the the real effects of inflation are much worse than than the figures would would suggest i mean it's it's tough to ask me because i live in puerto rico everything's like super inflated here because it's an island and everything gets <laughs> gets shipped in but i mean it, it's it's a funny thing like we'll take a look at like if you aren't if you're on x like i am way too much and uh, I'm on there and I'm watching like uh, the different people that that chime in, people from Canada, people from New York, people from L.A. Yeah. And they talk about the cost of living and how high it is. Yes, it's obviously super ridiculously high. But in some places, it's actually, you know, reasonable to say, I mean, yes, everything's, you know, filling a crunch and and, uh, you know, food and gas and electricity, of course, is going up. But in some places, it's like astronomically high. In some places, it's just not that high. We know what that it's there. But I, I think some people get a little bit biased and correct me if I'm wrong. Everybody in the comment section can can chime in like where I'm at. Everything's super inflated. Anyhow, so I can't really not a good barometer of that. But for other people, I mean, is it is it 
unsustainable right now for the food cost? And we'll get into this in the Q&A. Is it unsustainable, the food costs? Is it unsustainable for the real estate? Is it unsustainable for the bills? And where do you live? That's the big question. Because I can tell you, like, I mean, people in the Midwest, I mean, in some places, it's not too bad. I got family over there. In some places in Mexico, also family. They're not, it's not too bad here. But in other places like Austin, got a couple of friends, unsustainable. So it just depends. Guy, yeah. one, I, I meant to show one more chart, uh, and it kind of goes to what Rob, I mean, if you look at, at the different categories, you know, if food and beverage is actually back down to like kind of around 2%. But the main contributor right now to, to, to inflation mm -hmm. going back up this past month is housing, because housing, you can see, makes up such a large contribution of the overall CPI number. And that went up slightly. And so you can see that, you know, the, the actual inflation went up or, I mean, look at food, Rob's right. I mean, look at, look at the price of eggs. <laughs> it's starting to go back up, you know? No. Um, and I, and this is the issue is that, you know, it's, it's hard, to, it's hard for us to sort of get inflation out. It's really hard to, to get it to not become entrenched. Um, and yeah, like when this stuff keeps going back up, you know, it, it just sort of makes the problem worse and worse and worse. And, and it causes, you know, just more people to, to struggle. Cause I mean, I, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but we've talked about this before, but I mean, it, the, going to the grocery store is so expensive now compared to what it used to be. And, and you look at these charts you're like, well, that's why, I mean, everything's just, uh, here's the price of chicken. It has come down a little bit, right? I mean, it was what, 475. Um, now it's come down to about 411, but it's still, look, I mean, look how elevated it is compared to where it has been for like the last two decades. You know, it's just still, still very high. Yeah. 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 And, and yeah, obviously this is going to have, <clears throat> this is going to be felt in, in crypto and other asset markets because we can't have, we can't have a, a bull market if people don't have disposable income, you know, that that's what goes into, that's what goes into crypto. That's what goes into stocks from, you know, kind of regular folk, if you like, um, when there's something left over, but you know, if your chicken, your eggs, um, and everything else, if your if your daily expenses are so high, then the, there isn't going to be anything left over. Um, yeah, it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a grim grim picture, I think, and perhaps a lot uh, you know perhaps a lot grimmer than the um, than the actual sort of official statistics make out. And I know there's been a lot of debate about how these you know how things like the CPI are calculated and and. Uh, suggestions that the Fed sort of are very you know, quite selective with what with what prices they use, um, you know, and, and a, a lot of the time these are things that don't really reflect the true state of the economy or, 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 or the true state of what people uh, are needing to buy and therefore how they're feeling the effects of, of this inflation. So, yeah, I think this is like it or not something that we've just got to you know keep an eye keep a, a, a close eye on because it's it's going to feed into crypto and and everything else um okay let's let's switch back to something more crypto specific i'm afraid we're still kind of on the on on the fuddy side of the fence at the moment um i want to ask about uh these e, uh, spot ETH etfs um it seems now um that the that the chances of them being approved in may are incredibly low so i'm just curious as to whether you guys are still kind of or, or whether you guys are at all um bullish on on those etfs uh, spot ethereum etfs i should say being approved is, is this something do you think will will even happen this year um and then ben specifically you is is ETH going to continue to underform btc so maybe if i start with rob rob do you no. what are your no, thoughts do you, do you think we will even see a spot spot ETF, etf this year okay i'll take it i was gonna say start with ben but because you know he's he's good with this one but no for the for the spot etf again and i and i was the bitcoin spot etf i was wrong you know but what are you gonna do uh, as far as the, oh, as far you as were the, not wrong about it. You were right for like seven years. <laughs> yeah, but everybody remembers the last points, Ben. Like Rob was the guy. I'm like, oh, whatever. So, like for for the for the ETF, if we just take a look at that, the probabilities, it doesn't look too good, and looks like it's not going to go through. But people are very optimistic. So let's hope it does. But I don't think it's going to actually happen. And I will say, like, I don't know if it's going to happen or not. But I bet I I think 
if it does if it does happen great the spot the the price will, will go through the roof and everybody's happy right but let's just say that it doesn't it, you know if you're a if you're an ethereum holder an l2 holder you know if it's arbitrum or it's base or if it's well you can't hold base what am i talking about if it's if it's uh arbitrum or optimism or something like that then you know you won't get that you won't get that that big pump but i still think that i know some people will say well you know ethereum's dead anyhow because it's just awful and it's unusable but if you you know because of that ding Kuhn upgrade which guy you team did a great job on that on that video i mean if you have done anything on on l2 on ethereum it's reasonable and it actually works out pretty well and the prices if you go to l2 fees.info the prices are a penny two cents three cents it's looking pretty good so i know people will say well you know because the whole thing we're, the reason why we ask this question is is it going to pump my bags that's really what it comes down to right let's just be honest so of course if it doesn't happen then of course ethereum is going to kind of lag it might actually as ben calls it come home and then we'll see like like a breakdown of that and then that's it i still think ethereum has a little bit of room to run it sucks for an l1 but i think the l2s and, and even guy you did a video yesterday on l3s which i had no idea there was a mm -hmm. that was a thing so i mean i think you can do pretty well it's just that these these projects that come out, they have to build on the L2 and stop stop uh, for their TGE, their token generation event, stop doing it on, on L1. It sucks and it dries up the cost and, and it just doesn't work. Just build it on L2s, pick Optimism, Arbitrum or Base or something like that, even Polygon, ZK, EVM and go from there and it'll actually work out pretty well. So I still, I still hold everything I just talked about, but We'll see. But I don't think it's going to be approved because, I mean, just by the probabilities, Balkun has talked about it and we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. It does seem it does seem kind of unlikely now. I think um, I think even uh, Matt Hogan of, of Bitwise, one of the one of the um, asset managers looking to to issue these these Ethereum ETFs. Obviously, they have a Bitcoin one, spot Bitcoin one. Um, even he's saying perhaps, you know, perhaps we should. It's better if we just wait you know we've we've got our we've got our spot bitcoin etfs let's be happy with that let's let's worry about spot eth etfs a bit later on um but then i want to i want to move on the set and ask you the second part of that question specifically um from what you from what you're seeing is is eth going to continue to under underperform btc in your in your opinion i do think so but i i think also it will probably bottom sometime this year okay so let me show you um so uh, can you see my chart? Yeah. So yeah, got it. yeah, like I've been pretty bearish on the ETH Bitcoin valuation really since right around here, May of 2022. Um, and, you know, we, we dropped, we then came back up and we saw that rally into the merge. And then really ever since then, it's been bleeding um, kind of all the way back down to the range lows, which is a very common pattern for it to, you know, to sort of carry out sort of the double peak. Uh, we've seen that so many times, double peaks and then bleed back down to the range lows that you set between the first and second peak. And then you eventually break it, you eventually break it right here. And then, um, you know, and then you, you go down and you form your low. So I, I think that the ultimate low is going to be somewhere between 0.03 to 0.04. And I don't really know if the, you know, if the, as far as Rob said, I mean, he said he thinks that ETH can, you know, it still has more to give. I mean, that, that could definitely be true if Bitcoin goes up, right? And that's kind of the point is that, you know, ETH is ETH USD is not going up right now by itself. It's only up because Bitcoin is up. And we know that because ETH Bitcoin is down a lot. You know, we've heard a lot of people say over the last couple of years that ETH Bitcoin is holding up well. But the reality is it is down, you know, 43 percent against Bitcoin. Yeah. Right. And so that was why two years ago I went on this, you know, these long rants about Bitcoin dominance and never really stopped is because, you know, Bitcoin lower risk. There's not going to be as much regulation risk uh, with Bitcoin as there's going to be with a lot of these other other cryptocurrencies like ETH. And even look what happened with Uniswap just the other day. Um, so a lot of these have, have really bled back down a lot on their Bitcoin pair. So you're seeing Bitcoin sort of suck that liquidity out now. I don't know if the spot ETF for Ethereum is going to be approved or not. I mean, I really don't care. I think that if it if it's not, it will be used as the reason for why this ultimately breaks support. So go, go, it gets a weekly close below 0.049. But I don't think that's the actual reason. I, I think the actual reason 
is just based on monetary policy. If you look, and I've talked about this many times, but if you look closely, ETH Bitcoin back in the last cycle, it broke support just before the first rate cut. And it bottomed this green line here. That is, um, that's the, the balance sheet, right? That's sort of mm. the balance sheet or it's net liquidity, um, total assets. Actually, I think it's just total assets here. I'm not, I'm not really sure which one I clicked on, but you can see that ETH Bitcoin bottomed when the, when the Fed went from QT to QE, right? It was that simple. It, I mean, sure, we could have found a thousand different narratives for why it happened based on what was going on in the market. But at the end of the day, when quantitative tightening was happening, ETH Bitcoin bled. And when quantitative easing was happening, ETH Bitcoin went up. <laughs> it was that simple. It wasn't any more complicated than that. And we, but then we try to make it more complicated. We try to say, all right, well, is it going to be because of the spot ETF rejection? Is it going to be because of this regulation stuff? Maybe it's just based on money printing, right? So I, I think that it, it will break um, and, and go down, but I, I don't think it's going to go back down to like 0.01, right? I think it'll probably bottom between 0.03 and 0.04. I've had that sort of target for a long time. And one of the reasons is sort of looking at these prior breaks when it breaks down and you can see here it dropped around 42 percent when it broke here it dropped around 35 percent um mm -hmm. so if it does break here if you were to go down even 20 percent, that already gets you to 0.03 to 0.04 right so that's kind of why i think that 0.03 to 0.04 range will eventually mark the bottom for ETH bitcoin and my guess is that you'll see the fed pivot uh, sometime later this year. And they've already started talking about slowing, you know, tapering down the QT, right? You know, like slowing it and and stopping it. They've talked about it. So it's probably going to happen sometime, um, you know, a little bit later this year. That's what I would look for, for a potential bottom. And again, if if you're looking at this and saying, well, you know, if last cycle, it didn't bottom until after rate cuts, what if the first rate cut doesn't come until September? I mean, that's a long time from now. So, I mean, it's possible we keep kicking the can down the road for another, you know, five months or something. But it's also possible that the Fed has already over tightened and, and it's just taking a while for monetary policy to sort of get through the system. And once it becomes abundantly clear, then they'll pivot sooner than the market thinks. And, and one thing I'd like to just point out, and, and, and it's it's why I talk about this stuff so much, um, I, I've looked at Matic Bitcoin as something that's been leading ETH Bitcoin, okay? And Matic Bitcoin, you, you can see it, it broke support the week of March 11th, right? March 11th, it broke support. It's the same thing that, that the ETH Bitcoin has, right? It put in a, a low in June of 2022, and then it finally just broke support. Now, if you look at it, Mar the week of March 11th was when Matic Bitcoin had a weekly close below the range low. Ever since March 11th, Matic USD has been going down. So that's why I talk about all Bitcoin pairs so much. As long as we are at 0.4 or above, we're at 0.45, as long as we're at 0 .45, 0 0.4 or above, alts can go up with Bitcoin. Like Rob was saying, ETH could have more to give. But if they break down, if they break below 0.4, then I think the collective altcoin market follows kind of like what Matic USD is doing after Matic Bitcoin broke down. And it's not just Matic. I mean, a lot of these coins are doing the same thing. Like look at, uh, and stop me if I'm going too long, but look at, 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 at dot Bitcoin. I mean, it, you know, it just put in a new, a new low, right? I mean, it already took out the October, 2023 low, right? Look at, at ADA Bitcoin. It's back at these lows here. So a lot of these altcoins are testing these range lows. We're, we're starting to see some of them break already. And once the individual altcoin breaks off its Bitcoin support level, then the alt USD valuation goes down. ETH Bitcoin still has not broken, right? It, it still has not broken. So it, we're not necessarily there yet. And if, if Bitcoin gets a rally into the halving, then Rob could definitely be right about ETH USD seeing more, you know, more to the upside. And if you look at the pattern that Bitcoin had going into the, uh, the spot ETF, about one week before the spot ETF, we swept the high. And then on the spot ETF, we put in a local top. So, you know, we're about, I think what tomorrow is one week before the halving. 
So I would say if, if, if Bitcoin repeats that pattern, then yeah, it's gonna it can drag ETH with it. But if during that move by Bitcoin, it breaks ETH Bitcoin off support and we get a weekly close below 0.049, then I think you're going to finally see um, a lot of these alts, you know, give back give back some of those gains. But again, the the reason why it's so difficult and and why you know it's it's not it, it's been a really painful journey is because we could have made the same arguments in October and November and March and alt Bitcoin pairs bounced, right? So it's it's not about predicting when it happens. It's just to say, look, if it happens, then this is what it means. If we bounce and we kick the can down the road and we go higher for longer for another six months, then the alts can still hold on. But that's what I would look at. Look to see if on this current Bitcoin move if it breaks alt bitcoin pairs down and if it does that's the danger zone last thing i don't want to forget these things can take a long time last cycle it took exactly 41 weeks for it to break after the low was set 41 mm -hmm. weeks. okay if you go to this low we're in week 41. i don't know if it's going to happen this week but you know it, it kind of seems like everything's coming to a crescendo the week of the having right like you know it seems like ETH bitcoin is sitting on support alt bitcoin sitting on support and my favorite metric bitcoin dominance is you know it, it's putting in i mean look at it right it's it's putting in new weekly high new weekly closes higher weekly closes than it has since 2021 and so it, it kind of seems like all of it's building up to the breakout point. Bitcoin dominance building up to the breakout point. ETH Bitcoin is is getting to the cliff. Alt Bitcoin pairs are getting to that cliff. And if all those things break, if if Bitcoin dominance goes up like that, and alt Bitcoin pairs go down like this, then you might actually see the Fed pivot sooner than the market thinks. Not because they care about your altcoins, but it, because it represents the consumer finally showing weakness. I like that. Forty one weeks. I'll I'll take it. This is it then. Yeah. Ben called it. Promo and all. <laughs> no, I, I actually don't. It might not happen until now. I, I think it'd be really poetic for it to happen the week of the having. You know, like all the. Uh, I think Bitcoin will take that liquidity from alts next week. Yeah, I got quite possible. I mean, this, this I, I forgot. Fun, but this week is already almost over. You know, we only got like a, a few more days. Yeah. Is this is this the last NFA live before the halving? I think we get 19th. one more. I, I, I no, because I, I think the having is in what seven, a little, little less than eight days. Oh, is it the nineteenth? Yeah, it might be the nineteenth actually. But so maybe we be, can do a. Yeah, it should be on the half. Maybe we should move NFA Live to the. To the <laughs> the having day because I think it's on. I think it's on your channel next time, Ben. It is. Maybe that'll maybe be when Tom finally channel. hits fifty six percent. We'll see. <laughs> hey, since you have a deep voice, Rob, can you say Bitcoin dominance is going to 60% and in the deepest voice you can? Bitcoin dominance to 60%. Uh, who, who's not going to believe that? Oh, exactly. <laughs> That's the voice I, of the I, I very much hope someone's going to cut that bit out and 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 uh, and save it. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, Ben bullish on Bitcoin. Who would have thought it? Um, Ooh, that's crazy. Bitcoin dominance. Uh, let's move Bitcoin dominance. Bitcoin dominance. Bitcoin dominance. I should say. Yeah. Um, now, I was going to aim this next question at both of you, but considering considering what Ben's just been talking about, I think it's probably <laughs> better if I just aim it at Rob. Um, Rob, have you ever have you ever because airdrops like you know people are talking about. People are talking about lots of things in crypto at the moment, but none more so, I think, than meme coins and airdrops. I think we've covered meme coins quite a lot, you know, on NFA before. I, I personally haven't got anything particularly new to say about them. But airdrops, I think, are, are kind of fascinating at the moment. So, um, Rob, have you, you know, have you ever have you ever received one? Um, and what are your what are your thoughts on them? Really? Are they are they a good thing, a bad thing? Are you indifferent? Yeah, they're awesome. So I will say this, like airdrops, if you're going to do that, first of all, get educated. Uh, there's a, like three people I listen to about airdrops, guy. And then also your, your boy, Crypto Cito, who's been hanging out with Nick a lot over on Coin Bureau Clips yeah. and, and Lady of Crypto. You guys, they do a great job of breaking those down. The second thing I'll say about this is that if you're going to connect your wallets to all these different airdrop 
uh, applications, just know that you're at some point, you're probably going to get rug pulled or you're going to get uh, hacked or something's going to happen. So if you want to do that, you can do that. I've done two air. Well, I've done more airdrops than that. I'll be honest. But the, the, the two easiest and safest are through Phantom Wallet, which is on Solana. And it just tells you, like, you're eligible for this wall, this this airdrop. And the two that I did was when and there was one uh, for wormhole. And uh, just so you know, yeah, just so you know, like when you do that on those on certain airdrops, it'll ask you, are you part of this restricted territory? And you have to go through it. And if you're a part of like if you're in North Korea, if you're in Nigeria or if you're in some places, North Korea. Or if you're in the United States, which I felt was ridiculous, then you cannot partake in those airdrops. So um, I'll be honest with you. I say no, and I still claim the airdrops because I'm sick and tired of of the SEC and them bowing down to everything. So I say no, and I get the airdrops. So I know at some point that'll probably go up against me, but I'm sick and tired of bowing down to these jerks. Anyhow, so yeah, for the airdrops, yes, I've done them. I think they're great, but just know that uh, you know there's a good good amount of scams going out there. Watch watch yeah. guy or lady of crypto or crypto seat. I remember the, uh, you guys remember the Uniswap airdrop in like 2020? Yeah, it was awesome. Or was, it, or was it 2019 or 2020? I think it was 20. I think it was DeFi summer, right? 2020, 2020 I think. Yeah. My, my, I, I haven't really done airdrops this year because you guys know why. But um, I would say <laughs> that, that if you are doing airdrops, what I used to do, and it always worked out quite well, was mm -hmm. I would, I would take like at least 50% of it and just convert it to Bitcoin right away. Yeah. And then like let the rest ride on some type of like, you know, just in case. But like that way, that way, if the if that altcoin just goes to zero, at least you got something out of it. Um, and if it goes up a lot, then you get to ride it. Exactly. Exactly. I just did a video on this. It, it, it was called the half and half method. Whatever you because we get into risky stuff, right? I know guy doesn't do much and then you don't do any degenerate stuff, but I do. And like as soon as it doubles, you take 50 percent off and then you either hold it in stables cash or if you want to do Bitcoin, too. When it doubles again, you do the same thing and you just kind of write it all the way up because there's a big difference between like taking profits from established like Bitcoin or Ethereum or something like that, as opposed to like the new stuff. So, but it makes sense. Just take, if you get an airdrop, half it, and then you're like, hey, at least I got something. Hmm. That's about thinking what you were saying earlier, Rob. That's pretty much the only, uh, it seems, seems to me, the only thing that North Korea and the United States have in common. Yeah, no, we're both we're both on sanction list. So yeah, that's fantastic. We we're, we're finally making... some common ground. Maybe <laughs> maybe maybe this could be the start for a for a, a start of a detente in relations between the United States and Korea. Um, mm. Yeah, no, I would uh, I would I highly recommend what uh, I'd second what you were saying, Rob. Definitely listen to um, uh, Cito and uh, Lady of Crypto on airdrops. They 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 do some they do some great stuff. And you know, in our Discord server, we have um, we have an airdrops expert as well. And I'm just I'm I'm always just amazed by how much you know how much stuff there is going on there. I mean, a lot of it is a lot of it is just crap, and you can and yeah. you can ignore it. And I should say as well, you know, a lot of it is stuff that you do have to you do have to kind of work for you know it's not just yeah. it's not just stake these coins get and you know, get these coins at a later date you know that that still happens mm -hmm. but a lot of them you know require you to do all sort you know it might be just it might be sort of retweeting stuff or it might be you know using the protocol um there was that thing that i think it was for the stark airdrop not long ago there was there was a lot of controversy wasn't there because someone had Commit. Um, I think you were eligible for Stark tokens if you had, uh, if you um, made any contributions to the code. And I think someone had gone through and like corrected a couple of spelling errors and, and made <laughs> made absolute bank on uh, on airdrop tokens. Um, yeah. And the other thing I always find I always sort of seem seem to find with airdrops these days is that uh, you know. People love them, but they're never they're never happy. They never feel they got uh, they never feel they got enough. Um, it's, wasn't that, uh, it's impossible isn't that every investor guy? Happy. Was sorry, that everyone, sorry? It's everyone in general, not even just investors. We never feel like we have enough. Exactly. Yeah, that is very true. That is very true. Um, okay, so last talking point before we uh, before we see what uh, the people in the question in the comments have been asking. Um, 
what's the biggest investment risk you guys have taken in your life? Did it pay off? And if not, what did you learn from it, if anything? Um, I, I was wondering about this because you, you guys don't strike me as the, as the riskiest um, of, you know, the biggest risk takers out there. I, I, I think there are probably a fair few other crypto YouTubers that <laughs> may have been better people to ask that. But I'm, I'm just curious to know anyway, because I think it's, uh, you know, I, I think it's always interesting to know these sorts of things. Um, so, Ben, have you what's what's been your sort of highest risk? I, I think a lot of the uh, you know, my, my view on this is that um, every cycle, like people become less or they come, they become more risk averse. So like people look at me today and they just assume that I was always like that, but it's not true. Like, I mean, last cycle, I, I definitely took on more risk cycle for that. I took on even more risk. Um, I just yeah. think like when you, as you do, as you go from one cycle to another, you just start to see that like, all right, Bitcoin has always been number one. Ethereum generally has been number two, at least since, you know, like 2017. Um, everything else kind of comes and goes, you know? And so you, I, I think a lot of people just kind of, they go through this this cycle, their, their own cycle, their own process of like, you know, at first it's 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 Bitcoin and, and a thousand different altcoins. And then the next cycle, it's Bitcoin and like five altcoins. And then the next cycle, it's just Bitcoin and ETH. And, you know, you kind of like, get, you kind of like whittle your way down to, to only caring about the ones that stick around. And you can recognize and, and take some risks on some of the ones that can do well, but your main your main focus is the ones that actually stick around. So, you know, I definitely bought a lot of altcoins in prior cycles. And I probably, I mean, I it's not like I'll never do it again. I just, if you're in a Bitcoin dominance rally, ride the wave, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think that, yeah, I, I mean, I definitely made a lot of money on, on altcoins. Um, I mean, I remember 2017 was a crazy year. And it wasn't, I mean, I think a lot of people just joined at the end of 2017. Um, but I mean, throughout the entire year of 2017, a lot of altcoins were going absolutely parabolic. Um, Ethereum was one, XRP was another, Litecoin was another. A lot of those coins were doing incredibly well back then. And, you know, I did I did pretty well on a lot of those different investments. And, and even um, I, you know, was able to take profits on a lot of that stuff. But... There's also for every everyone that does that, you know, you you buy an altcoin that you'd like to forget about because you buy it and it and it just goes to zero, right? So some of them have paid off. Like some of the investments that I've done have paid off. Um, if I just think about like the ones that I have receipts for on the channel, right? I mean, like you know, being bullish on Bitcoin, Ethereum, Chainlink, and Cardano in 2019. That was a great decision because you know they all went up at least like 50x or something um and so that was a great decision but then there's other times where i've bought things and they don't do well right like you know some type of it's kind of like if, if if someone bought uniswap two weeks ago because it seemed so bullish and then now you got this sec stuff coming out and now it's just you know capitulating right like that stuff can happen to people um, and, and I think when that kind of stuff happens enough times, people just sort of gear more towards, you know, the things that that stuff doesn't happen to. And Bitcoin generally doesn't fall, fall to those same types of, of things because it's not as prone to regulation risk as a lot of the altcoin market. But I, I, I think that um, my the things that I've learned and we kind of just touched on this with with the whole airdrop stuff is altcoins are great. Uh, you can make money on them. But when you get profits you know, convert it, you know, you can convert it to Bitcoin, right? And, and again, it, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing. You could do something like what Rob suggested, whereas like, say you buy an altcoin, it goes up 2x, you can sell half of it. And if you don't want to sell half of it to the US dollar, because you're just like, well, it's going to zero in terms of its purchasing power of a long enough period of time, you could just convert it to Bitcoin, right? And at least you at least you're preserving the Satoshi valuation of your portfolio. Um, so I think that is has been the biggest lesson I've learned is that you know it's okay to take risk in the altcoin market over your your journey, but just remember taking those profits back to Bitcoin occasionally is the long term winning strategy. It took me forever to to sort of recognize that and to admit it, but once I did, the cycle got easier. Uh, good well to said. know. Good I'll to say know. That. Good to be reminded of. Yeah. Rob, what about you? What's what's been your sort of big most risky investment and what have you learned from it? 
before I say it, I'll, I'll just say this, that everybody that, that listens to, to Ben's story, they think, oh, Ben's not really risky. But remember, Ben took risk at some point. I mean, it was kind of crazy in 2017 to really get into that when we had heard that China was banning Bitcoin, Bitcoin was going to zero. There was a, you know, uh, it was just crashing. And of course, it would never come back. So like when people say, well, that sounds you know very easy and that's not really risk. That is risk. And Guy, when I, I the story that I remember about with Guy is that when I started my channel, they, they were starting their channel. They took a lot of risk just to start that channel. And the same thing is Guy's been investing for even longer than I think all of us. So at some point, you have to take risk. And I know, but on that continuum, at some point you're going to take risk, then you maybe want to de-risk. Like for me, I will tell you, like, I figured out that this was in 2013. I was uh, I was working like a regular job intake coordinator for for a hospital where I would deal with patients and nurses and doctors and you know, for to see if they would be qualified for intake. And I thought to myself, OK, well, I have real estate now. I have my online education platform and I have the sports facility. Why don't I just get rid of this job and just do myself? And that was it. And then, of course, you take risks and then you're like, this is a lot better. So at some point you think to yourself, I got to take risks. And that was one of those risks I took. And then you get into other stuff Then you take a little bit more risk. But you learn that you can't take massive risk, like taking your entire life savings and putting into Wencoin, which might have actually done pretty well for a couple of weeks. But you would have lost everything at some point. And then you just realize, like, OK, I'm going to take risk. But there, there's a reason why I have these five rules. One of those is don't invest more than you can afford to lose which is, you know, like, hey, if I'm going to get into crypto, I'm going to get into real estate, I'm going to get into precious metals, I'm going to get into a business or something I do, I don't want to lose everything. So I'll just tiptoe into it a little bit and then take a little risk and go on. But I, I, I will stand by this, is that if you want to make it in the world, you can't play it safe. At some point, you have to take risk and you have to get out there and you have to be willing to fail, but just be a little bit measured in what you're doing and not go crazy. And that's that was my big thing. It was back in 2013. Wise words. Wise words. Um, yeah, I must say, I mean, it's it's it sounds obvious, but Bitcoin buying buying BTC back in 2014 was a was a big risk for me, partly because, you know, I, I really didn't have very much money around that time. So, I mean, BTC was still I, mean, I, I forget exactly how much it was, but it's, I mean, it didn't feel it didn't feel cheap at the time, obviously. Um, but yeah, it felt like a real, and, and it wasn't, and the, the, the whole process wasn't made any easier by the fact that, you know, buying crypto in those days was so, was even more of a kind of dicey experience, uh, you know, than it is now, you know, so many, so much, um, so much progress has been made on, on the actual buying process. Um, but back then it was, it was really kind of seat of the pants stuff. It was, uh, it was pretty scary. Um, Okay, thanks, guys. We are we are coming up on time. I was going to go through a few uh, audience questions, but I see the um, the meme coin scammers, uh, the meme coin um, uh, shillers have appeared in the chat, which tells me it's probably about time we uh, we wrapped it up anyway. Um, quite a few people. Uh, I did see a, quite a few comments on Rob's voice. Generally, Rob, it's a thumbs up. You, you should keep it. <laughs> sure, I'll try to get sick more often. <laughs> I can give you some tips. Yeah, I could. I'm just gonna babysit for Ben's kids, and I'll, I'll have this, constantly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to leave with this comment because this is something that uh, I feel very strongly about, and I think it's extremely, I think it's uh, extremely correct. Joe Booty, thou shall not commit a security, but you can put it all on red at the casino. Absolutely, that's that's good. <laughs> That sums it up for me. I will never, I will never tire of uh, of banging that drum. Well said, Joe. Okay, Ben, Rob, thank you for joining uh, today. It's been been a great discussion, um, even if it's not been on the, uh, the sort of the best news day for crypto. But uh, as I said, the market doesn't seem to care. It's uh, BTC still sort of around seventy k, which is great to see. Um, so next week, uh, next week is Token twenty forty nine, which is happening here in Dubai. Oh. So I will have to uh, let you guys know nearer the time whether I'll, whether I'll have uh, time to sort of join join on the stream um, because it's as you can imagine it's like most of the crypto industry is in town <clears throat> next week so I may well be busy schmoozing on a yacht somewhere uh, at some at some some party I can't escape so who knows but um uh we may we may have NFA next week or we may not but I'll let you guys know sort of nearer the time if that's all right
I mean, it's not like anything important is happening next week, right? Yeah, a little thing. <laughs> Absolutely, we can we can forget all about it. it. Would be nice. It would be nice to do a sort of eve of the halving one. Um, I don't think we'll. I don't think we'll stretch to a to a watch along. Um, that would be. Ooh. I think that would be a little too geeky, perhaps. But uh, yeah, if we can if we can uh, fit it in, fit one more NFA in uh, pre halving, that would be awesome. We'll try and make it happen. Sounds good. We'll Thank see. You know I mean? We'll see. Awesome. Well, thanks again, gents. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Um, and thanks for your thanks for your various various comments and opinions. Insightful as always. Um, ben, great to see you. Rob, great to see you too. And get well soon. And uh, we'll be back uh, back on uh, it's Rob's channel next. My time. channel, Ben. Ben's channel. Ben. I always forget. Ben always Rob guy. Ben Rob guy. <laughs> you can say it as many times as you like, Ben, but I'll still forget. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you all soon. Bye, guys.